uh, thanks to the organizers, and thanks to Barbara for having me here. As others said, it's exciting to go back to this in-person exchange. Hopefully, we'll be able to stick to it. The uh, title is, you know, I provided two years ago, and it was so broad, it still works, no matter what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I like to highlight, in the spirit, I guess, of Collège de France, um, a bunch of ongoing work, some in press, other things in preparations, that come from collaborative efforts with a number of people over the years and right now, trying to link uh, structural seismology constraints with our understanding of mental dynamics. And here's sort of what we, where we want to go. Um, you know, we want to build models that incorporate the knowledge from all of the geosciences to you know, understand how our planet evolves over time. What is shown here is a global viscoplastic computation of something akin, perhaps, to some version of plate tectonics with continents uh, conspicuously absent, where Lucas Fuchs uh, has implemented this damage rheology, where weakening happens as a function of accumulated strain that feeds back into the rheology. And what you get are these uh, remnants of past deformation that are shown here in these green contours on top of the poloidal and toroidal velocity fields. And those, those zones of weakness uh, get convected around. And you know there's interesting things happening. Plate boundaries are reorganizing. And it appears that, in particular, strike slip toroidal sort of motion likes to uh, happen along these pre-existing weak zones. And we're trying to figure out what is going on in these models and what does that mean for the Earth, if anything. And obviously, rheology is hugely important. For example, as, as Paul pointed out 20 years ago in Cartesian models, the uh, uh, degree of localization underneath the spreading centers depends on the viscosity underneath there. And so we're trying to get at this problem of what controls planetary evolution, both from an applied, what does the Earth look like right now perspective, and from a long-term evolution, and from a discovery kind of point of view. And so shear wave mantle tomography, is super helpful in that. And we've heard a bunch about different methods on how we build these models. Uh, the comparison, this is uh, Steve's, um, uh, Steve's recent model from Steve's group. Uh, here's work from Barbara's group. And here's a model that uh, we came up with based on earlier efforts by Ludwig Auer and Lapo Bosky. And um, what this model does is it's trying to incorporate um, all of the data due to US array, EarthScope, and re reproduce high resolution upper mantle structure while not foregoing um, uh, mapping of structure throughout the remainder of the mantle. In the process of building these models, what I learned was that more data isn't necessarily better. Right? You would think like you throw everything in, the fundamental modes, the overtones, the body waves, it turns out many of these data sets are inherently inconsistent. And why that is, as some of the previous speakers mentioned, is, is an interesting question and sort of speaks to the uncertainty in the data, speaks to the different ways these data sets have been created, but that was, that was real clear. And so this model here does not include all the data. We've consciously left some out, and it sort of does OK. And so it kind of does a good job in terms of improving resolution in the upper mantle, which is important. If you're interested in dynamic topography, for example, Bernard Steinberg is going to talk about some of that stuff, while not sort of completely messing things up in the lower mantle. And broadly speaking, as we heard earlier, the shear wave structure of these models is consistent. So what you can do is you can take the structure, convert it into temperature, make assumptions about rheology, and then provide, uh, come up with forward models. And so this model takes a somewhat different tack from what Steve talked about earlier. We have a simple scaling. We uh, just say whatever 0.2 is the scaling between the velocity anomalies and the density anomalies. And then I, I assign a viscosity structure. And what comes out are these plate motions. And what you see in the background, those are predictions of the geoid. And so the way this works is that the velocities go with the density anomaly divided by the viscosity. And the geoid and topography are mainly sensitive to the density anomaly. And that lets you then play games and ask questions, well, what happens if I change this or the other thing? 
This particular model has a pretty good match to plate velocities, correlation is about 0 0.9, and the geoid is sort of okay. You can do better, and that speaks to the importance of the surface boundary conditions. But overall, there's a consistency here in terms of the interpretation for general flow in terms of plate tectonics. Now, we know it's more complicated than that. One way to look at the thermochemical heterogeneity that surely exists is to compare S and P wave models. You know, three fairly recent models, and you can see particularly the Pacific anomaly looks very different in P wave models, something we've known for 20 years and something we're still trying to figure out. And so, well, uh, I think Paul is going to talk a bunch more about the lower mantle. I'll be focusing on the upper mantle, but just in passing, you know, we heard about uh, the importance of viscosity, right? And Nicola said, well, viscosity is linked to temperature in, in a way. For example, if we can parameterize it in terms of a Frank Kamenetsky approximation to the full Arrhenius term, and then this E thing here, that should be about 30 or so, given laboratory constraints on viscosity, meaning slow velocities are indicating hot material, indicating weak rocks. Now, one of the more interesting studies uh, recently in global mantle circulation is a work by Yang and Gernis, where they inverted for that E factor, and they found a negative value for the lower mantle, which kind of doesn't make any sense, because why would slow material actually be stronger? Unless you allow for compositional anomalies, some sort of blobs in the mantle, or the beams of, of Maxime here, and that could then apply that, well, maybe these hot regions are actually the interiors of these blobs, therefore they're stronger. So if you switch E in the same computation, you get something that looks, well, not too different from what we had before. Plate velocities compared to the old values go down, the geode actually goes up. So this tells you that, yes, you should do joint inversions, but how you define your misfit metrics is very important, and it's kind of tricky to invert for rheology on these large scales. Um, and so if we have specific questions like, well, how weak is the asthenosphere, there's other ways of getting at that. The weakness of the asthenosphere matters, as Paul showed for Cartesian models and others have shown for global models, because if you take these plate tectonic models and you allow for an asthenosphere, the wavelength of convection changes. Right? That's something we know from Peter Bunge's work from um, <clears throat> a long time ago. Now, we can then play around and change these things in a forward sense in geodynamic sort of fundamental models, or we can look for certain regions, do an applied um, ge geodynamic sort of approach where this is a flow model now, which has some sort of background um, asthenosphere here. And here's the same flow model if I drop the asthenosphere viscosity. So you have a bunch more small scale anomalies some emphasis of Poisson as opposed to um, Couette flow and so on. And so how do we test these things? Well, one way to try to tease out a little bit more sensitivity from those range of constraints while allowing or while sort of requiring different assumptions is to look at seismic anisotopy. Seismic anisotopy for the upper mantle uh, is complicated, but in the asthenosphere is thought to be related to the crystallographic preferred orientation of olivine. And that means that whatever we measure in terms of the anisotopy depends on the path of the rock. So there's an integration over the velocity gradient tensor, and that integration means we have a bit of a memory sensitivity, and it's perhaps better than looking at just instantaneous properties such as the geoid and plate velocities. We can use mineral physics-based approaches to compute CPOs. A number of people have done that. And here's an example of what you come up with in terms of a comparison from a global flow model, now predicting CPOs, and where this is blue, is this is matching global azimuthal anisotropy from surface waves, and where it's red, it's, it's bad, and so overall this works. And so we are faced with this interesting observations that generally, you know, the same flow model that predicts the plate velocities in the geoid predicts anisotropy on large scales, yet regionally, here's an example from the NOMALD experiment, this doesn't work. And so there's always this challenge, what is the reference model? What is our general background, and how do we have to mess with the background to improve our knowledge about second order features, like the rheology of the asthenosphere, or like melts that we're gonna speak about in a second. And so what you can do is you can take this model and then mess with it and break it. 
One way to break the model is by making the asthenosphere too weak. So you get a disruption of patterns, and all of a sudden, you lose that fit to azimuthal and isotopy. The plate velocities actually sort of don't change much in terms of their orientation, but their speed is sensitive to the asthenosphere. And so what I did a couple of years ago now is play around with different forward models. One of the remarkable things, I think, is that if you look at the azimuthal and isotopy misfit at some sort of depth for three different seismological models, then there's this sweet spot of asthenospheric viscosity reduction that also leads to the best fit to plate velocities in terms of their correlation. So this is flipped around. Whenever these curves go down, this means, aha, this is, this is a preferred value. Now, this factor 100, asthenospheric viscosity reduction, as many of these features, has a trade-off with thickness. So whenever you have a channel that you want to decouple something, it's the thickness and the strength that controls this effect. But you cannot make the asthenosphere too weak. Within the context of that assumption that CPO links to anisotopy and that our mantle flow models aren't completely whack. Right? But within that assumption, it's consistent, and it doesn't matter which of these models you use. What, what <laughs> this, is a, this is a thin one, and it was a thicker one. If it's a thicker one, meaning like 200 kilometers, it's about a factor of 1 over 10, and this is like a 100-kilometer one, I think. But there's a trade-off, and, um, and, and there's, a, there's a scaling with like the depth to the power of, of 3. Elon Nardik and Mark Richards wrote a paper about this recently. So what also happens is, I'm going to show in a second, if you have patches that might be melt-related, then those patches cannot be too large or too coherent, otherwise they also mess up the fit to anisotropy. Now that's interesting because, as we heard earlier, there's different lines of evidence that melt should be present in, perhaps, large parts of the upper mantle. And so here's a, here's a review uh, figure, work by Kate Riker, really nice, showing you the places as a function of seafloor age where um, melt has been detected with different methods. So there is probably melt around, but does it matter? I once asked a student the question in like a sort of qualifying exam, can plate tectonics work? without partial melting. That student is now a professor at ETH and still mad at me for asking that question, but it's interesting because there's different effects of melting. Is it the rheology? Is it fractionation? Of course, we get a melt to make continents, we get a melt to make crust, but how relevant is it mechanically speaking? To get at this, in some sort of roundabout way, um, I was lucky enough to work a little bit with Jun Lin Hua, who has joined Steve Grant and myself as a postdoc, at UT, and based on work he did with Karen Fisher and others, he's recently completed a global assessment of receiver function profiles, and he was able to classify them into two groups. One that shows this, um, <clears throat> this low velocity signal here, at sort of 150 kilometers depth, and one group that does not have that feature. Okay, that's interesting, and so what does that mean? How can we group these things? One of the things he did is he aligned these receiver functions by shear wave velocity, and then sort of flipped on its side. You can see that for different um, seismological models, and perhaps you know, with a preference for oceanic you know, domains, the, it's low velocity shear wave anomalies that seem to lead to a preference of that phase. Using modeling, he was then able to show that it's plausible that this low velocity region is associated with partial melt. You can then make predictions here for the shear wave velocities and for the radial and isotopic psi. And depending on the assumptions you make for the rheological effects of melt, you should then expect perhaps a quite dramatic difference in radial and isotopy. This is from a 1D model, very useful to do, a 1D sort of flow model. What we can also do, we can go back to these models that I developed for azimuthal anisotropy and look at the radial anisotropy component. These are now forward models, again, global stuff, um, showing you what happens now, not for uniform asthenosphere, but for these low viscosity bands. Now, the way this is set up is that anisotropy is computed up to saturation. There's some logic behind that. And so if, under these assumptions, we would mainly expect uh, reorientation to result um, from viscosity changes, 
and effects in radial anisotropy should be subdued somehow. But what you can see in particular by comparing radial anisotropy at 100 and 200 kilometers, for this case where you have these sort of Richter roll kind of stripes, there are changes in radial anisotropy mostly by shifting things up and down. So this would say that if these things that form azimuthal anisotropy should not be coherent, should not be coherently weak, but if they exist, associated with melt, for example, if they lead to viscosity drip, drop, then you should see it in radial anisotropy. Now, radial anisotropy models, as you know, are less similar to each other than isotropic models, but you know, on the longest wavelengths here, cross-correlation plots, you are seeing some degree of coherence. These are limited to the upper mantle. And so, you know, it's not particularly great, but spherical harmonic degree eight correlations are somewhere around 0.4 or so compared to 0.7 for isotropic um, anomalies. So we're getting somewhere by comparing these models, yet there are differences. And so when you then group the isotropic velocities and the radial anisotropy, then you can see that all models show this effect of low velocity anomalies, but for radial anisotropy, there's no or an unclear signal. So if there's melt, if this means there's melt, there's probably no impact on viscosity on those scales, which is interesting. Now, I want to end this with a regional exploration, because global is great, but regional can really give you some important clues. When we look regionally, we often look at subduction zones. Subduction zones are where plates are being reworked rheologically. They are, of course, where continents are made, and they're also where Plate tectonics, oceanic plate tectonics, imparts these sutures that I mentioned earlier on the overriding continental plate. We've used seismic tomography since you know, 30 years to try to understand how mass transport works, and it's still a little bit unclear. And so um, <clears throat> later in this um, uh, session, uh, we're going to hear, I think, uh, about rail and I thought to be using that to understand subduction. But what I want to focus on is, is Japan to some extent. When the background here, you see what, what I think is sort of a, an amateur connoisseur is, is one of the more exciting models. That's from Steve Grant's group again. And this is based on full waveform imaging. And you can see all these interesting complexities uh, in the slab along the margin that I'm going to talk about in a second. Now, how does rheology come into play here? For one, Slabs are contorted, and as Chiskova and others have pointed out, as many have worked on, you need to somehow break or weaken the slab to reproduce these contorted forms. And turned around, a weaker slab where the low yield stress, here, plastic yield stress, for example, is less likely to penetrate. And that then somehow has to be related to these autocorrelation functions that we heard about earlier. And this is something that's been done since the you know, late 90s, where you can look at the correlation of one layer of tomography with another one and then plot it different ways. Here is the radial correlation at a constant distance. And you see this drop that we heard about earlier around you know, 800 or 1,000 kilometers or so. What is interesting is, of course, that you know, this drop is contingent on the parameterization. And as Barbara mentioned, the Harvard models had a decorrelation at 660 put in for a long time. And it turns out this drop of correlation depends on the data sets. And so what Lapoboski and I did in this experiment leading to this kind of complicated plot is turn it around. We said, well, if we allow a seismic tomographic model to decorrelate, what is the depth at which that a priori assumption improves the misfit to the beta, data the most? And so for different kind of data sets, you know, it turns out this depth is actually below 660, and it's around 800 or so. And this emphasizes, I think, that it's important to understand what data you put in, and it's important to do a forward test. But now, how, what, what is happening around that depth and what is happening at shallow depths? Somehow, we know that there has to be a transition from brittle to ductile behavior, perhaps low temperature creep. And what is amazing for Japan is there was you know, a hor horrific earthquake, uh, which um, nonetheless taught us a lot about how the Earth deforms. And the earthquake, the Tohoku Oki 2011 M9 event, was large enough such that the post-seismic deformation samples the same spatial scales that we're interested in, the upper mantle. And you can then do an inversion for the short time scale viscosity, and you find that there's an indication of weakening in the lower plate, which is interesting. It could be piles creep, 
or it could be something else. It could be related to those damage kind of rheologies. Now, damage is a broad term. There's different ways of localizing the, uh, the deformation. What I've shown you earlier is a computation that's akin to grain size evolution. Here's a test from work from Lucas and myself last year doing very simple 1D sort of slide hold slide test showing you what happens for simplified rheologies as we've used in this computation and for different grain size evolution laws. They're not the same. And since this one here by Dunberg et al. leads to a dominance of diffusion creep in the upper mantle, which is inconsistent with formation of CPO by dislocation creep. Again, very important to get consistency here. So, but damage is one way. And the damage can be in the brittle or in the ductile domain. And I want to end by exploring some forward models, work by um, Taras and, and Dave Berkovici. They were kind enough to talk to me. And so we know that plastic yielding matters, but what happens if you now combine brittle and ductile damage? Okay, and so this is a free subduction model that has brittle kind of fault weakening and that has grain size evolution in it. And so this is a way of using geodynamic models for, this, for exploration, right? You don't always have to match something to find something interesting. What happens is that the interplay of brittle and ductile deformation leads to a segmentation of the slab where the center can still transmit forces, but you can bend easily, sort of like a toy snake. And that's kind of nifty, because it only happens if you have both fault weakening and grain size evolution. If you only have fault weakening, it looks like this, only have grain size evolution there. If it's neither, sort of, it's harder to bend. So it's an interaction between these two physical processes, which is kind of cool from a physics kind of perspective. And so the spacing depends on the thickness of the plate. Here's a 40 million year plate, and here's a 100 million year plate. We submitted this. One reviewer loved it because you can bendy, bendy, and pull the plates at the same time, which is sort of a question, how does that work? The other one was like, well, there's like zero evidence for that. So we tried to come up with some evidence. And one of the things you can look at, you can using active source and identification of faults, again, from Japan, is that the offset on these normal faults you get seems to increase the closer you get to the trench. These are observations. Same sort of thing happens in these models. Kind of interesting. Now, another thing that I was hesitant of doing, but that is kind of intriguing, is go back to Steve's high-resolution models and then ask, well, where are these small-scale features are coming from? There's been suggestions that there's a plume disrupting um, the slab, that there's this hot anomaly. There's a lot of different kind of explanations for the tomography, but what is nice is if some of the segmentation that can be seen might be related to a general rather than a specific process. And so what we did is we went along the slab and we said, aha, there's these pinchy things, and perhaps these pinchy things in terms of their separation actually have something to do with what we're seeing in the slab. Now, that's maybe pushing it too far, but there's other indications. And so if you look at impedance-based uh, imaging, there's this uh, po possible melt percolation barrier invoked by Kawakatsu, and that might, in fact, be related to the grain size reduction. And there's also an identification of deep metal phases, perhaps also in the places where we would get this grain size reduction zone. So looking at um, a slide missing here, so um, combining so this rheological effect of ductile and brittle weakening gives you segmentation. That's an interesting feature that comes out of a forward model. Perhaps it is reflected in seismic tomography. Perhaps it's associated with large offset normal faults, and perhaps this is one ingredient that is general and that might help you to understand both plate boundary evolution and deep metal structure. So in conclusion, these global geodynamic models allow hypothesis testing, right? And I prefer a model that fails for a reason I understand to one model that explains all. So there's a bit of a different philosophy here, for instance, in terms of treating seismic tomography. But you can, you know, you can do science in many different ways, and, and doing it in as many as possible, I think, is the most fun. These regional observations, right, they hold important clues for refinement. And I think, you know, thanks to the efforts of many, stuff like Steve's group regional tomography is really interesting because you can, you can question it. And then it becomes a matter of sort of, you know, style of, 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 of choice, 
if you prefer a regional explanation, if you think this is telling you about specific of te tectonics in one place, or if you are able to fold it into a global consistent understanding of how things work. And I find this a personal challenge, right? Do, are these models meaningful on global scales? I think so, yet there are these regional deviations and, and what does that mean for understanding? Melt, in particular, seems to be secondary for viscosity, both based on azimuthal anisotropy in the absence of a radial anisotropy signal. So it's, it's there, it is seen seismically, of course, but it's perhaps less relevant for tectonics, as is sometimes assumed. And I think in a general way, didn't have much time to talk about this, using hypothesis tests and going back to the actual data and asking which wiggle might tell me about metal wedge hydration is a really good way to go. And I think this will also help with some of the remaining uncertainties about the deep mantle. Thank you.